Hello everyone. Hi, I'm João Gervasio, but you can call me Jay. Easier, shorter, no problem. And today I'm going to guide us through the journey of DNA data storage, coding and decoding. We'll talk a little bit about what we are doing for the last decade. Roughly, you get why. You, we all know about the problem of data storage that we all face. It's estimated that we will, ha we will produce 181 zettabytes of data soon. And when I say soon, I really mean it. Uh, according to the IDT, it will happen in 2025, which is basically, I mean, tomorrow. And when it comes to mind, we have some questions that are, do we have enough physical space to deal with that? What about energy consumption? and environmental problems that, that, that might generate. I don't have uh, an easy solution that will solve that problem, but I can tell you how biology does deals with that. In nature, we have two different molecules that already does that, which is stored data that later it will use. It's the DNA and RNA. And how are they? The DNA and RNA, they are molecules that they have some characteristics precisely some very interesting chemical characteristics. We all, if you were here before, you know that A bonds with T, C bonds with G, and th that bonding, it's very good for the stability st to make the molecule stable. And what we like when you're talking about storing data for a long time, a stable medium. So DNA would be perfect for that. And when you do that, it you might come to your mind, okay, nature does that, it lasts for a long time. Can we also do that? You will not be the first one to have this question in mind. Back in 1958, Richard Feynman did exactly that same question. And from there on, we're thinking in ways to solve that problem. And I can answer that question for you. And yes, we totally can do that. The first time it was done, it was actually in 1988. And if you guys do the math, really, 1988 was a little bit more than 10 years ago. But why do I say that? In this first example, there wasn't a, a, an actual mapping system for bits to DNA, bits to A, C, T, and G. Instead of that, they work in a phase shifting way. C's would mean that the same bit, zero, would repeat one time, T2, A3, and G four times, and that's how we mapped it. It's not necessarily the most efficient way, but for as this was an art piece, was enough, and it was good, it worked. What Actually, oh, here we all know about the DNA data storage pipeline that starts with coding and ends with decoding, and in the middle we have to synthesize it, store, and later sequence. Everybody talked about this a little bit, I don't think we, I need to go even further, but what actually changed the game was back in 2012 when Church, Gao, and Kosuri published this article. They could uh, store 5.27 megabits of information into DNA. I mean, 2012, it wasn't an amount, great gigantic amount of data. But if you think back in two years before that was the largest amount that was one kilobyte and it was just a barcode. And here they actually employed a codex system that could encode and decode. The way they did that was simply uh, like mapping one bit would be a base, zero, A or C, and one T or G. You might think to yourself, that's not optimal. I can see that you have one bit being represented in two different ways. You might get a, a little bit better than that. And now I have to say to you that there are some constraints, some challenges that we face when you're talking about DNA data storage. And in this case, not necessarily that the molecule, it's impossible to exist in that stage. No, we can, it works, it's physically possible, but it might be challenging to recover the, the sequence later. And these are the three main challenges that we face when we are trying to develop a codec. And we have this in mind. We only can synthesize nowadays short sequences. More than that, we should avoid repetition. Here I will call this repetitions of bases like AAAA, TTTCCCs, homopolymers, and we have to maintain our GC content around 50%. GC is like literally how much Gs and Cs you have in a molecule. So you can do the math. It should be roughly around 50%. And that's why Church, Gao, and Kosuri made that mapping system that is not optimal. Uh, as I said, we can only synthesize short sequences, around 300 nucleotides. If we go to the most 
incredible way of data density would be two bits per base, we would have like 100, uh, 600 bits. And 600 bits, unfortunately, it's not a, a big, a large file. So for now, we are not able to synthesize a whole file. But Church and the, uh, his colleagues solved that by splitting the data into many, uh, many short files. And up until this day, 10 years later, is the same way that most researchers and facilities do. They synthesize small, short fragments of DNA that later can be used. The other thing is, as I said, avoid repetition. If you go back to the, to the mapping scheme, one bit could either be A or T, C or G. So you can change it if you have repetitions, if you have like long strands of zeros and ones. And the other thing, GC content should remain around 50%. And here we have exactly the same thing. Zero would be A or C. So you can, again, change it to attend those constraints. And Church did. Here is just an example. I will not go one by one uh, converting with you, but the presentation is available, so you can do it. In this case, uh, if you just, let's say, set A and T, A is zero, T is one, you have a lot of homopolymers, you have the GC content zero, basically, but you can use the, this mapping scheme to solve this problem, and in this case, you have no homopolymers, and you also have your GC content around 45%. So, Every problem is solved, let's continue, that's over, technology, yeah, not so much. As I said, this is not, that was not the optimal way. And in the next year, Goldman and his colleagues, they also proposed another way of encoding that, by doing a rotational code. By, while, while doing so, they will avoid every single possible homopolymer. As you see, here is the, oh, here, excuse me, oh, the other way around. Here you have all the previous bases, perfect. If you have this basis here, A, C, T, or G, you will never have it after that. So they propose that to avoid every possible homopolymer while still maintaining a better ratio of basis bits per base. And here I have a simple exercise again. Uh, if you have a number uh, the, in base 16 and hexadecimal 17, I chose for uh, binaries this 010111 because you have a stretch of ones and just to show that we can actually do that without any repetition. Instead of using a binary code, we have to, to convert it for a ternary code. Why? Because, as I said before, here you only have three possibilities. Converting this 011011, you have 0212. And in this case, you can make the change. If the first, uh, the first base, if we have none, we always assume it's A. The next ternary is zero, so we have C. And so on and so forth. Before C, the next two A. And then you have uh, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, so you do have an a uh, stretch of the same bit, but here you don't have, you have a CACG. But here, they do not address the problem of uh, GC content. Although they do not actually address this problem, this code ha has been used and was used later on with uh, 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 a simple equation of an XOR uh, using a random key. By doing so, in the theory, you randomize your zeros and ones, the, the, the distribution of your bits, and you, in consequent, sort of, I don't know the actual math, you should also randomize the result of your, uh, or your DNA. And when I say random, you have the same distributions of A, C, T's, and G's. And I tell you, it works. It actually works. We tried a lot of times that, and it, you have uh, roughly between 45 to 55% of CG content, although we didn't necessarily try to change that. It's just a, an easy exoring uh, equation. Later, later on, uh, Grass and his team also drove inspiration from biology, which again, it's important that if we are talking about biological, uh, biological materials, we should draw inspiration from nature. And in nature, our cells do not have any meaning by one base. A means nothing, C means nothing by itself. But when you combine three of them, they do mean something. Here we have an example of ATG. ATG 
Oh, this is the genetic code, okay? So if you want to know the stable or the, the, the disk, you Google genetic code, you have something like this. If you have ATG, your body will say, oh, this should be a methionine. Perfect. Can we do the same thing when talking about data storage? Can we give meaning for this codons, this, uh, this three-base system? Uh, yes, we can, and we have done that. Like, not, not, not me, but we as a society, but as uh, data storage, uh, DNA data storage people. And we did that, uh, but instead of using every single possible codon, we took every, all the ones that ends with the same basis. By doing so, we avoid those homopolymers. And in this case, specifically, we would have 48 possible combinations of three, three bases, but we only used 47. Why that? Because here they had to construct a Galois field that should be in a prime number, and 47, it's a prime number, it's close to that, and they can implement the error correction code of Reed Solomon. Uh, and they did it. By now, we have coding and encoding, and we have error correction system. So far, kind of similar to any other storage system. What is lacking is random access. And this is something that was talked here before, that we should be able to access only the data that we want. We should not be uh, constrained to the fact that we have to sequence everything to actually get our data. And this was also solved in 2015 by Yazdi and his colleagues. They did this, they, they solved this problem trying to access only uh, files that they want by putting a specific primer Thank you very much for you that, that explain what actually is a primer, but it's a small tag of DNA that we need to recover this file. They did that and they could sequence it, getting only the files that they need. So by now, it's clear that the technology can be used the same way other storage technologies can be used because we have coding and encoding, we have error correction and detection systems, and we can access only the files that we want. And here, but this does not mean that we do not have room for improvement. So far, not every conversion systems are optimal in terms of data density. The, what we would think that is the best way of doing this is by converting two bits to one base, one to one, easy, that is done. But there are those the constraints that I said before. And in 2016, Blavat and his colleagues proposed this method that they actually use the most optimal way of converting it, but only for the first uh, six bits of a byte. The last two bits, they actually grab from a different conversion table. And by doing so, they can avoid homopolymers, they kind of sort of can uh, balance the GC content. And this is very useful, and we decided when we did our one of our experiments to actually use it, because it's very fast, it's easy, and it works. Um, as I said, the data, the data density that we strive for is two bits per byte because you can have this simple conversion because we have uh, an alphabet of four instead of binary. And more than that, in this case, I want to talk about this article that was published in 2017 that they actually tried to measure how much data can you recover with as little DNA as possible? They literally diluted their data. They put more water and took only parts of it. And when they did that, they found out that it's possible to recover information with 1.21 exabytes of DNA, of data, for, uh, by gram. And this was only five years after the first experiment that Church did. This is 210 times denser than it was before, in only five years of technology. And for a long time, this was actually a statement, long time, I mean, 2017, <laughs> not that long, but for most parts of, of this process up until 2020, that was the standard that we have, which is very good. I mean, it's impressive. But so far, every experiment that was done was not with a large amount of data. There was one that was 45 megabytes, which was the Goldman one. But in 2018, uh, Organic and their colleagues, they actually could encode 200 megabytes into 35 different files into DNA. And this was very important to show the, actually, the actual capability of the 
uh, of the technology. We can store large amount of data. It might not seem a lot, but that's what we had in mini disks back in the 90s. And, and the, 200s, early 200s also. So here it is, it's a possible, it's a viable way. But more than that, we also have to, have to face what other challenges we, we have when we're doing with a large amount of data. And here they had a problem that was actually clusterizing the sequences. When we sequence DNA, we don't have, as uh, she said before, we don't have one copy and say, oh, that, that's a copy, perfect. <laughs> that's it, decode it. We have millions of copies, tens of thousands, hundreds, sometimes only tens, sometimes zero, <laughs> but we have a large amount of data and you have to decide, oh, which one is actually the sequence that we want? And here they face that problem because they have like 15 million unique, uh, unique DNA sequences and that, and you multiply that by 350 times, that was roughly how many copies that they had, okay, how do we decide that? And they developed a very nice uh, clustering system not only the proprietary one that I think is with Microsoft, but they also proposed another one that we can use with the data that, are, that is available here. And that's it. That's basically the points that we need for our technology to prove it, their self viable. But again, it's not that we solve some problems that we cannot evolve. Here we have an example of a Huffman code, a very simple, nothing different from, from bits and bytes, when you have a whole byte being represented by a code word that it's a little bit better, a little bit lower, in this case, a bit, perfect, there's no problem. You can actually use the, the possibility of having a four, four digit, but in this case, four letter alphabet, to compact your data. Instead of you, of, of making code words that are zeros and ones, make code words that are actually A, C, T's and G's. And that was done by Mishra in 2019. And it was so ingenious because at the same time you compact your data and make the, ma ma the mapping system. And in this case specifically, they went a step further. Not only they made this, this compaction system, but they also avoid homopolymers as each, uh, each branch they will have uh, either A, uh, T, or C, or A, or G, so you don't have homopolymers, and you also don't have a gigantic uh, GC content because you have ATs, GCs, ATs, GCs. And even like that, they thought, okay, but sometimes one code word will end with G, another one will start with G, we don't want homopolymers. They said, okay, no problem. We make a mirrored uh, Huffman tree that also will avoid that. So you avoid all those problems that was previously mentioned. And, and by doing so, they could achieve the, uh, the data density of 3.82 bits per base, which is more than the optimal two bits per base. Of course, we all know that there are some constraints when we're talking about uh, compacting data, and it also applies to here. But it was, it, it's an inventive way, and it also shows us that we can be file-specific. There's no problem. You don't have to have one codec that solves everything. Sometimes this will be better for let's say maybe texts or maybe images. And another thing that happened in the same vein of that is instead of building a binary Huffman tree, uh, Zhang and his colleagues, they proposed a quaternary Huffman tree. By itself does not make any more compact just because you have four possible branches every time. But in reality they did, but when scaling up, it's sort of the same thing as the binary Huffman that I showed before. But then again, it's important to know that we have more possibilities right now because of that. And as I said, in this case specifically, I use the, the example as abracadabra because you have repetitions of A's and it's nice. And uh, you get something like 5.82 bits per base. But it's just because it's a small scale. And large scale basically is the same thing as the binary Huffman tree. And in this case specifically, you also don't solve those problems of GC content and avoid homopolymers. But there is even more than we can get from our knowledge of biology. We only have four bases. That's it, A, C, T's, and G's. But one thing that we do in biology that it's very common, sometimes you want to match your DNA, but not completely, just roughly. And what we do in this case, we construct pseudo bases. As I said, you have many, many, many repetitions of the same sequence. And you have many repetitions of the same sequence in exactly the same position. If you have, let's say, an A, 
half of your sequences, you have A, half of your sequences, you have G, instead of saying, oh, this is an AG, we now have an R. We create pseudo-bases, bases that do not exist physically, but can be interpreted when, uh, when anal analyzing the data as a different one. And in this case, we can have up until 15 pseudo-bases, four actually real bases, and 11 pseudo-bases. This was done and tested by Choi and his colleagues in 2019 and showed that it actually works. Uh, and again, a simple conversion of this system would be if you have four, you should, be, you should have two bits per base, and if you have 15, you should have 3.9 bits per base. It works roughly, but there are other parts of the DNA construct that will short this a little bit, but go further than we have as optimal before that. Oh, how rude of me. I am talking about ACTs and Gs and haven't shown their faces. Here they are, the cytosinguanine. It might not mean anything for many people. For me, for example, it happens. I know, I understand them. And they, as I said, they have very, very nice uh, chemical properties. And they are amazing, they are unique, they have never been done before. Yeah, but yeah in, in nature they haven't. But we can actually make synthetic DNA. We can develop other molecules, and these are actual real uh, uh, other uh, nucleotides that exist. Z, P, S, and B, they are part of something that is called Hachimoji DNA, but there are others. And they have exactly the same, uh, the same properties of A, T, Cs, and Gs. They do form the, uh, the double helix, they have this bond that they are uh, they are stable, and by doing so, if it takes just on this four and the four that we already know, we will have eight possible bases. In this case, an actual real alphabet expansion, not a pseudo uh, expansion. And in this case, we would go to the three bits per base as our optimal goal. But, Jay, you just said that if you have four, you can construct 15 pseudo bases. If you have eight, the sky's the limit. You can have 256, yes, and if you do the math, you would have something like 8 bits per base. Imagine one byte for each molecule. Personally, I would not go to this route because of other problems, but the possibility is here, and I think it's, it's important to think every way. One thing that I want to show that also was done in 2020 is actually retrieving information by uh, encoding metadata on your uh, on your storage device. In this case, we have some silicon-based QR code squares. I don't know. And when I say silicon-based, I mean, I mean glass. It's some kind of glass, but I learned with my friends there are engineers of material that not every glass is the same, so silicon-based squares. Uh, and in, this, in each of the squares, you have actually the DNA Support to that, as Marilia showed before lunch, you have the, the, the surface there. So here you have all the DNA that you need, and when you scan it, you have this meta information here. Here you can see it much, but it has the name of the, uh, the, name of the file, when the file was coded, the size of the file, and the primer that you need in order to recover this data. So there are other ways that people are thinking when talking when facing the problem of DNA data storage, that goes beyond only coding and decoding, solving those problems that might not be obvious at, this, uh, at front run, but we have to face it. And here I have to say that every single challenge that I proposed back in the beginning that church faced, we have overcome it. As was said before, the bottleneck of this of this process is not coding and decoding, which does not mean that, again, I say I said it twice, I'm saying a third time, we cannot evolve. We are able to avoid all homopolymers if we want, we can control the GC content the way we want, and we can even escape from unwanted sequences. Uh, somebody asked in the, first, uh, in the first presentation if, oh, but, if you have the sequence that you use when talking about the, no, not the first one, when in the Rosetta Stone one, if you have this, that sequence, isn't that a problem? Yes, it is a problem, but there are uh, codecs that also solve that. I use here an example of MRC, but there are many other. I will not, I will not make a citation for every single codec there is there. There are some very prolific uh, study groups from uh, France and Israel that I did not include here, but they also see uh, these kinds of conversions. And I just cited 
highlighted here, this one from MRC, that does exactly that. It avoids homopolymers, it controls GC content, and it also avoids unwanted sequences, being that sequences part of the process of recovering or something that we don't want to get from nature. Maybe we just don't, don't need that. We don't need a DNA to be actually used for anything else, and we can avoid that. Those problems are done. And as I said, I really want the last, uh, the last paper that I will cite here is this one that was actually published this year. And I am basically forced to, to talk about it because church, the same church that 10 years ago that uh, encoded 5.27 mega, megabits of information was part of this uh, codec. And this codec is very inventive because you have not one mapping scheme. You have two mapping schemes in the same sequence. So if your upper limit, it's two bits per base, just to have, just having two messages in the same, you would have an optimal four, which is amazing. And it kind of sounds a little bit inception-y, like the movie, it's a message inside the message, inside the DNA, it's some, some sort of, I don't know, a spy program. But it, as I said, I think it's very uh, inventive from uh, the point of view of the art authors. And in this, uh, in the same paper, they did that that was done in 2017 to see what is the minimal amount of, day of DNA that I can have to actually decode and have our information. And in, remember, from 2012 to 2017, five years, 200 times the answer. Now, from 2017 to 2020, 2,000 times the answer. And they did so not only by changing the algorithm. Erlich and Zinlinski in 2017, they could achieve that a lot also because they changed the error correcting system. Uh, Read Solomon, it's very common, it's used in CDs, it's used in other ways and in DNA data storage also, but he, uh, Erlich and Zinlinski in 2017, they used the fountain code uh, using Luby transform and they changed, they named DNA fountain, which, well, makes sense. And they did that so they could make even denser data. Here, not only they optimized the, the way of correcting code, but they also optimized the, the way of decoding this process. So you need less amount of that same sequence to recover it. And again, 432.2 exabytes per data per gram. That's an amazing density of data that you have. And this is actually possible. They did that uh, in a way that they store DNA in living cells in, in yeast. But even if you do not go through this route that they also did, they also tried uh, the goop of DNA, even going to the goop route, they also achieved 2.2 exabytes of data per gram of DNA, which again, it's, it's a whole data, data storage facility. It's amazing. And as I said, I was almost forced to talk about this paper because of that. And this was this year. Uh, that's the, the most, I think, in March was published. But what about us? What about us, Prometheus and our cheerleading squad that came here, everybody together? Uh, we also develop our own uh, codec environment. Our, our codec team developed an environment for simulation path. And here we use all <laughs> gods of the pantheon of Greeks as our... Uh, as our gimmicky, because it's the name of the of our project, but each one of those gods, they serve a purpose. For example, Ap Apollo is needed for coding, like so they, they do the mapping, they, he put, he, <laughs> the, 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 the Apollo protocol also goes through the, the error correction process that he imbues it, it, it slices the DNA into small pieces, uh, FS does, does the clustering part, and Artemis does all the decoding system. But we also need to have a simulation path because it would be a waste of energy and money to try. No, every time we want to try something, no, synthesize it. Like How, may, how many millions? Uh, do it. Instead of doing that, we also have a simulation pathway that does that and we try, oh, Apparently, the clustering here is not perfect. Maybe let's tweak a little bit. And we have this, uh, but again, as John said before, we are just in the beginning, nine months into the project. But here is what we are doing. But this that I told you right now, it's how long have we gone through this last year? But it's important to know how far will we go. It was stretched before here, and I need to say it again, 
we have to work together to go further. Academy, industries, we all need to build our expertise to make this a reality. I here I point to two, two uh, data formats that was built joining expertise, which is JPEG and MPEG. And I, I say DNA Ag, but I don't know if it's a good name. Uh, but we, knew, we need those experts to make this go forward. Efforts to create industry standards should be a priority, as this is the only way the market can actually incorporate this. Let's remember, this technology has the potential to be stored for thousands of years. Standards are important because, oh, maybe now, oh, but you can, you can contact the company. But in a thousand year, I don't know, maybe the company is not around anymore. But in these kind of efforts are happening. One of example is the DNA Data Storage Alliance that joins the efforts of very many different industries, companies, and academia to make it go further. And I think we are all here to give energy to transform this gimmicky marketing thing into a real stable solution. Thank you very much. Questions?